Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Harris, and I am the Director General of Communications at Veterans Affairs Canada. Today is Bell Let's Talk Day, and we thought it would be a good day to have a conversation about mental health for veterans and their families. In particular, let's talk about mental health first aid for the veteran community. So let me welcome you to the conversation for this Veterans Affairs Canada Facebook Live. Before we start, I just want to remind everyone that as part of Bell Let's Talk Day, Bell will donate five cents to mental health organizations across Canada for every text and mobile or long distance call made on its network. For every tweet or Instagram post using the hashtag Bell Let's Talk, for every view of its video on Facebook, and for every use of the Bell Let's Talk Snapchat geofilter. We encourage you to participate in this important campaign. Over the next hour, we are going to hear from our panelists, after which you will have the opportunity to ask questions online. Aujourd'hui, c'est la journée belle pour cause pour la cause, et nous croyons que c'est une belle occasion d'engager une conversation sur la santé mentale. Soyez donc les bienvenus à la conversation de la séance de questions et réponses sur la santé mentale en direct sur Facebook d'Anciens combattants Canada. Au cours de la prochaine heure, nous allons entendre les propos de nos experts et vous aurez ensuite l'occasion de poser des questions en ligne. The mental health and mental well-being of Canada's service men and women is of paramount importance to the Minister of Veterans Affairs and the Government of Canada. We can all do our part to end the stigma around mental health issues and remove this barrier to seeking care. Our panelists are going to spend a little bit of time to explain what mental health first aid is for the veteran community. They are going to tell us about their experiences with the course and how it has impacted their lives. We also want to open the floor to you, the viewers, so you can ask your questions about mental health first aid and the veteran community. Nos experts vont prendre quelques instants pour expliquer en ce qui constitue les premiers soins en santé mentale pour la communauté des vétérans. Ils nous raconteront leur expérience avec le cours et son incidence sur leur vie. Nous aimerions également donner la parole aux participants qui ont des questions à poser sur les premiers soins en santé mentale pour la communauté des vétérans. Sans plus tarder, permettez-moi de vous présenter nos experts. First, let me introduce Mireille Sear. Mireille is the Manager of Business Development for the Mental Health Commission of Canada's two training programs, Mental Health First Aid and Opening Minds. Next is Gada Maklouf. Gada is a mental health National Mental Health Consultant at Veterans Affairs Canada. Next, we have Linda Blanchette. Linda is a strong advocate for veterans, volunteers extensively, and works part-time. Next to Linda is Leo Phillips. Leo is a veteran and is the Director of Operations for the Trenton Military Resource Center. Next up is Kelly Briggs. Kelly is the Veteran Family Program Coordinator at the Trenton Military Family Resource Center and a trainer for mental health first aid for the veteran community. Enfin, j'aimerais vous présenter le dernier expert, André Bouchard, un vétéran et un formateur certifié. Each of the panelists is going to take a moment to share their experiences with the mental health first aid for veteran community. I would now like to ask Mireille to share her story with us. Please Thank go ahead. You. Thank you, Steve. So um, I've had the pleasure of being part of the development and the implementation of mental health first aid veterans community since 2015. The Mental Health Commission of Canada offers mental health first aid, and for those who don't know what mental health first aid is, it's similar to physical first aid, but instead of for physical problems, it's for mental health. Uh, the training uh, teaches participants how to have comfortable and effective conversations with someone who is developing a mental health problem, a worsening of a mental health problem, or provides them with skills to help someone who's in crisis. Participants learn how to recognize changes in behavior, how to respond and support uh, someone who um, is um, having a mental health problem, and then also guiding them towards the appropriate supports in the community. Les premiers soins en santé mentale ont été créés tôt en 2000 en Australie, et le programme a été apporté au Canada en 2007. Et donc, depuis que le programme est offert au Canada, on a fait la formation d'au-delà de 300 000 Canadiens. En collaboration avec euh, les anciens combattants du Canada, on a élaboré le programme des premiers soins en santé mentale pour la communauté des vétérans. This program is, to, is geared for veterans, former RCMP, 
for people who support and care for veterans. And so this can include relatives, neighbors, uh, community members as well, and service providers. Kelly, some of our Facebook viewers may see that you have a facility dog with you today. Welcome to Hercules. Please tell us your story. So um, I work at the Trenton Military Family Resource Center. I've been there for about 10 years. In 2015, I was chosen to be the Veteran Family Program Coordinator. Um, and then in 2016, had an opportunity to receive the training to be an instructor with Mental Health First Aid. Since I um, completed my instructor trainer, I probably offer a course a month, um, usually within our community. Um, and um, work with um, the population in improving their skills to help those in crisis. Thank you very much. Leo, can you share your story with us? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> I joined the military in 1986 as a young private. I uh, commissioned over to the officer corps in 2001. I retired last year, August 16, 2017. Um, my story is uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD, and uh, that was the reason I was released for medical. Uh, I can say right up front right now that as a result of the um, program that I attended, the uh, uh, first day for mental health for the veteran community, which is one of Kelly's first programs, uh, that just gave me the strength the first time come public and say that I've been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm living with it. I'm not going to say I'm suffering with it, but I'm living with it. And the, uh, my involvement was uh, I got to attend the course as a veteran, which is fantastic, but also a veteran that was releasing. And I uh, had the opportunity to hear some fantastic stories, some great testimonies, and more important is uh, the first aid course for me um, really showed me there was a lot of caring individuals out there who are interested in helping make a positive difference. It gives you hope, it gives you confidence, and uh, I'm very, very grateful that the uh, Veterans Affairs and the uh, um, Mental Health Commission and MFRCs are putting on this program for a person like me to uh, come out and say in public that uh, I was diagnosed with a mental health condition as a uh, a huge step and if other people can get that same um, comfort of coming forward by attending the course then please do so. Thank you Leo. Gada, could you introduce yourself please? Yes. Um, je m'appelle Gada Maclouf. Uh, je suis avec les anciens combattants depuis 2009. Uh, J'ai commencé ma carrière avec les anciens combattants uh, à la clinique résidentielle uh, pour uh, les stress opérationnels. Um, J'ai commencé comme travailleur social. Par la suite, j'étais uh, coordinatrice clinique. Um, J'ai commencé avec uh, la direction de santé mentale en 2016, janvier. Uh, puis uh, j'ai aussi pris le cours de premier soin en santé mentale avec Kelly en 2016. Um, one of the first projects that I had um, working at uh, Veterans Affairs with the Directorate of Mental Health was the Mental Health First Aid. Uh, project, and I felt that um, my um, my clinical work with veterans at the clinic um, and individual um, intervention as well as group intervention gave me a unique insight into the mental health challenges that uh, veterans may experience. So um, I feel very privileged and honored uh, to work with this population, and I look forward to continuing my career with Veterans Affairs and uh, making their lives and the quality of their lives much better. Merci beaucoup, Gara. André, pourriez-vous vous présenter? Oui, avec plaisir. Mon nom est André Bouchard. J'ai joint les Forces canadiennes en 1985. Euh, J'ai dû mettre fin à ma carrière pour des raisons médicales, euh, avec une carrière prometteuse. Par contre, euh, ça m'a permis euh, de retourner à la vie civile euh, avec euh, des limitations euh, assez difficiles dans mon cas. Donc, le retour au travail très difficile. Et puis tout ça, bien, ça m'a amené à, à rejoindre là, euh, anciens combattants avec des demandes et puis que je trouvais difficiles. Demande un conseil à un, demande un conseil à l'autre. Finalement, j'ai pris moi-même euh, en charge mon dossier, puis euh, j'ai été capable d'aider les autres à, à remplir le formulaire, à de faire des demandes avec anciens combattants, qui m'a amené à suivre justement le, le cours de, de premier soin en santé mentale. Euh, étant donné que j'adore euh, la santé mentale, ce qui a trait à mes frères d'armes, sœurs d'armes, ça me permet de voir que finalement, euh, il y en a des pires que moi puis que ça fait du bien aussi de, de s'entraider en, entre chacun là, pour au niveau du, de la santé mentale. Merci, André. Our last panelist today is Linda. Linda, can you share your story with us, please? Thank you, Stephen. I um, come from a military family. My granddaughter, a daughter, a wife, and a mother of people that are serving and still serving. I've been married for 39 years, and my husband was released due to PTSD. 
So I took the course to help put more tools in my toolbox. I work part-time for a physio centre and I do lots of volunteering at the Trenton MFRC uh, as well as I volunteer for OSIS. And OSIS is um, Operational Stress Injury Social Support for Family Members. And I help run the groups uh, twice a month so that the family members can come out to it. Taking this course gave me an awful lot of tools in my toolbox to be able to help my family, my kids, and the people that I volunteer with. Um, and I can't thank Kelly enough for what she did for us that day. Thank you, Linda. Mireille, I know one of the most popular questions that we got in uh, the lead up to this actual event has been related to the course. Could we start off maybe by telling us a little bit about uh, the course, who it's geared to, and if there's any cost to the participants? Okay. Uh, so the course is geared to veterans, uh, former RCMP, and those who care for and about them. Um, and so that can include anybody in the community, such as uh, family members, uh, wives, um, neighbors, um, who want to um, improve their skills on how to help um, a veteran um, with any mental health problems that they may face. In, uh, the, there is no cost to the course. It is subsidized by Veterans Affairs Canada and so can be accessed. Uh, if you want a listing of the courses, you can go on the mhfa.ca website and they're all listed uh, there. Alors, vous pouvez accéder les cours en regardant uh, à notre site web, PSSM, Uh, Jusqu'à date, on a offert, avec l'aide de nos formidables instructeurs, uh, 75 cours, plus ou moins. Uh, puis on a un autre 25 à venir en 2018. And so if there's not a course coming uh, close to you, you can always reach out to us through the website or through one of your local MFRCs. Perfect. Thanks very much. That, uh, just from the perspective of Veterans Affairs Canada, um, whenever there's a training or a, or a session that's set up throughout Canada, I, they will always send to me uh, a copy of the, po uh, of the posters. So I will disseminate that within Veterans Affairs Canada to the different departments. So for anyone who's looking for a session, you can also communicate with Veterans Affairs Canada either on the website, backgc.ca, or you can communicate with your case manager. I should mention also that although uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Canada does subsidize the course, um, the travel, uh, uh, the travel and uh, accommodations is not included. So, just wanted to let you know that there's other opportunities to find courses around the country. Thank you, Gara. We'll move to a question for all of the panelists. Andre, peut-être vous pouviez commencer. Um, quel était le plus grand bienfait que vous avez retiré au, du, cours, du cours du premier soin en santé mentale? Eh bien, c'est de me donner les outils euh, que je n'avais pas au début. Euh, J'allais avec mon expérience personnelle, avec mes, euh, mes, euh, mes expériences à moi. Euh, le cours m'a donné des outils, des ressources euh, qui sont très bien euh, expliquées à même le cours, puis à, à même le livre. On a aussi un livre qui vient avec ça, qu'il y a aussi des références pour des ressources là, à travers le, le Canada. Là. Please get some on me. Mia, would you want to talk a little bit about what the biggest <coughs> benefit of the course was for you? There are, there's a, quite a few benefits from the course. Um, I think one that stands out for me more than anything else is the, uh, the uh, self-stigma that if you're a mental health sufferer that you impose upon yourself. By attending that course and hearing other testimonials and hearing other stories, um, it shows that I was not alone and I don't have to be as critical of myself because there's really that's of no benefit. But uh, you know, instead of being in a denial, instead of being feeling like you're defeated, you failed, or you're weak, um, when you hear the testimonials of others, and you hear how there's such a group of caring individuals, and the organizations that are involved in addressing mental health for veterans is absolutely fantastic. And uh, that was the thing that I really got a lot out of, is that uh, it was easier to start eliminating some of the self-imposed stigmas uh, by realizing that you're not alone, and uh, what you're experiencing is not uncommon. And the good thing about it is there's hope, at the end of the day, you can live a fulfilling and very successful life with a mental health condition. Thank you. Linda, did you want to add something? Yeah, I agree an awful lot with what, Louis, what Leo Louis. said. <laughs> <laughs> no. Change my name. And I have to drive back with you. What Leo, <laughs> what Leo said. Um, and also for the self-care, to remembering that 
Um, families tend to forget about their self-care. They're so taking care of their sick one at home, taking care, especially as a female, you're, it's a female's intuition to take care of your families, to take care of the sick one, and it's that self-care part of it, you know, saying don't forget your self-care. And learning to listen is another, the empowerment of being able to sit back and actually just listen to what the person has to say rather than judging. Thank you. Kelly, as a coordinator and a trainer, what have you seen as some of the benefits uh, of the people who participated in the course with you? Yeah, I think just um, the message of hope and recovery and also the message of empowering people to um, be comfortable to sit and listen to someone who's struggling and, and not to take that on themselves, but to just be in, in, a, in a safe place with that person and listen to what they have to say and then get them to the appropriate professional help. Um, and participants tell me that by the end of the, the second day, they feel like they know what they need to do. So they, they feel stronger and more comfortable in, in assisting others. Thank you. Can I add to that, Steve? Because um, Kelly makes a really good point. At the end of the course, people feel a lot better. But I must admit, the course was intense because it does tug at your emotions. It does tug at some things that are difficult to live with, um, some experiences that you had that were not positive. And, like you said, at the end of the two days, when you get through that intensity of the course and, and you learn the different coping skills and the different tools that are available to you and the different organizations, you walk away going, this was one of the best courses I attended. Yeah. And I probably hear that from about 80% of the participants at the end of the, the two days, that they feel like it's one of those courses that gives them the tools they need to feel comfortable, but also that they're uh, very exhausted and mm -hmm. they go home and sleep a lot after the two-day course. Linda, you've been surrounded by uh, military members your whole life, and you've experienced life through the eyes of a mother, wife, daughter, and granddaughter. How have all these perspectives shaped your insight on how to support military members? Well, I'm a huge advocate for supporting the military. Um, growing up with both my parents were in the military until my mom had me and then she got out. My grandfather was in as I said, my husband, and when my son decided to join. Having my son join was probably the hardest part because I didn't want him to get an OSI injury, but watching him in the military is, uh, makes me very proud of him. I've watched him help his fellow members that have had PTSD, and he's made phone calls to me and saying, Mom, how can I help this person? Give me the tools and or where can I go to get him the help that he needs and it's it's a great gift to have to know that my kids are looking out now too so and they all support the military they're all very proud of the uniform thank you Leo as a veteran you know firsthand some of the struggles that military military members go through when transitioning from military to civilian life what would you say to someone who's in the midst of that transition Wow <laughs> Don't be scared to ask for help um, and don't procrastinate. Do it sooner rather than later. Uh, there is a process involved in releasing from the military, especially if you're releasing on a medical category. Um, you know, they want to make sure you're taking care of yourself as well as your family. And we've come a long way in the last 10 years, I would say, both from Veterans Affairs Canada, Department of National Defense, MFRCs. Um, there are some really solid programs and some really good advice and some great checklists and some fantastic tools to help you get through this process because it can be an overwhelming process at times. It can be difficulty understanding the rules and regulations and policies, but uh, ask for help. People are so willing to help you, all you have to do is ask. Est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à ajouter, André? Oui, euh, du support, on est, on est là pour ça. C'est ce qu'on nous apprend dans, dans le service, de supporter les uns les autres. Puis avec ce cours-là, on a les outils pour le faire, puis c'est vrai, euh, de, de supporter les uns les autres. Et on a déjà parlé un peu de le bienfait le plus, le plus important de ce que tu as retiré. <coughs> Mais est-ce qu'il y avait quelque chose qui vous avait aidé le plus à avoir suivi le cours? En oui. Aidant, euh, en aidant tes, euh, tes collègues? Oui, c'était... Euh, Souvent, en tant qu'ancien militaire, on, on écoute nos pères, euh, autant nos frères d'armes, sœurs d'armes, on les écoute, leur expérience personnelle, puis j'avais souvent tendance à me comparer avec les leurs, de dire, regarde, moi, c'était comme ça, 
c'est ce qu'il ne faut pas faire. J'ai appris ça dans, 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 le, dans le cours de premier soin en santé mentale. C'était mieux de les laisser euh, décanter, les laisser euh, dire ce qu'il y avait à dire et non de se comparer les uns les autres. Ce n'est pas ça le but. Puis euh, ça fait une, vraiment une différence d'écouter. De, de, la différence est là. Merci. Um, could each of you maybe tell me about a time when you use what you've learned in the mental health first aid course to help someone else? Kelly, would you like to start? I think for me as an instructor, certainly coming from a mental health background, it's just um, empowered me more in, in just having a process in place um, to use with people. And I think um, I use this course a lot to talk about stigma, um, to bring up the topic of stigma when it comes to mental health, and to be able to um, talk to people about the importance of the language we're using um, and how we're talking to people about mental health. Leo, is there something that you'd, you'd want to uh, add to that? I'm just thinking about, you know, um, how over the last little bit, things have changed so much. We went out for supper last night, and the first question I got asked is, do you want to sit with your back against the wall? And it was kind of funny because, like, um, yeah, there, you do that at times as a PTSD sufferer because you want that comfort behind you, nobody behind you. But for them to recognize that immediately, that tells you that, you know, this course gives you cues on what to watch for so you can become very observant and you can accommodate to the best of your ability that that person is able to enjoy that evening with you. And, you know, we would not have done that 10, 15 years ago. So courses like this particular course gives you the cues if you're a person that is not aware of PTSD or any mental health conditions and what the cues are, what to watch for and how to communicate. That's what this course gives you. That's how powerful it is. Yeah, and to do it in a way that's not offensive and, and is compassionate and kind and caring, right? Mm -hmm. It's just we're here, we care about you, and is this something that you need us to do to help accommodate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Scott, is there something from the, from the course that you've seen that's even helpful for you in, in the work that you do? Well, um, I've been working with veterans for almost nine years now, and, and um, you, you asked earlier uh, what surprises you about this training. And uh, Leo alluded to it earlier about breaking the isolation. It's recognizing that you're not alone, recognizing that there's others going through similar situations. And I also worked with families in my career. And it I used to get the same response when, when we used to do psychoeducation with families. And we, we did the training. They, they, they were surprised because they were living in isolation as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of uh, walking on eggshells and keeping secrets and not being able to talk to people outside um, your bubble. And so when I did the mental health first aid training, um, what surprised me as well was that I'm a member of the veteran community. So I felt privileged to be there as well. And I was on the receiving end of the training versus giving the training, which, which is what I'm used to. So um, it's really breaking that isolation. As Leo said, just reach out. Uh, Veterans Affairs has a lot of services for uh, veterans with uh, mental health issues. If you go to the website, backgc.ca, and you, you search mental health, there's plenty of programs out there, including the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And there's links that will take you to their website. And Linda, is there something that you've used particularly from the course so in, uh, to help someone uh, in a particular instance? Yeah, I, I, there's a few times that I've used it. And the biggest thing is the learning to listen without judgmental. Um, sometimes that's as a family member, and it is, keeping the secrets, walking on the eggshells. Your spouse may not want you, anyone to know that they have PTSD because they're still serving and they don't want the stigmatism to be out there or even if they've been released they still don't want someone to know learning to to listen without that judgmental is so it's such such a good gift to give the person on the receiving end of it and helping them to be the, able to speak without having to worry about it Kelly as a trainer Tell us a bit about the participants who take the course, and do you sense that they change, and how do they change as the course progresses? Um, day one at 8.30, you kind of see some nervousness. Um, people not really knowing what we're going to talk about, maybe what band-aids we're going to rip off a little bit. And um, usually halfway through the first day, you start to see that comfort um, building, especially between participants, um, sometimes leading 
change their seats in the room um, after lunch to sit with other people and you start to see the openness that starts to happen and usually by morning of day two they're they're a big happy family they're supporting each other if someone does get emotionally charged um, usually as facilitator I can just stand back and allow the participants to kind of care for each other um, and and usually by the you know there's phone numbers exchanged like there seems to be a camaraderie that kind of builds um, going forward can I add Let's go ahead, just something to what Kelly was saying too um, it's okay as a helper to ask for help as well mm -hmm. with all the training that you get and the, the mental health first aid is not intended necessarily to train people to become therapists or to intervene with people with mental health it's monsieur madame tout le monde who is expected to intervene and if you know you feel overwhelmed as a helper it's okay to ask for somebody else's help and in reality the veteran or the the, the individual you're helping has two people there to support them so that's okay too and Kelly and, and maybe Mireille, you'd like to answer as well. I'm sure you see some genuine connections during the duration of the course. Is that one of sort of the goals and objectives of this course overall to, uh, to improve and, and involve the face-to-face -face interaction among the participants? I think that learning from each other and sharing some resources and some supports that exist out there that maybe one person might know about but the other doesn't, I think um, that's really helpful to participants when they finish the two days. They, they realize that there's so much out there that they may not have uh, recognized before. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that with the veteran population, it really is um, veterans helping veterans in most cases and veteran families helping veteran families. And so it really is about that in the group is, is them um, supporting each other going forward. Um, and I think that's what we do a really good job of with this course is we have lots of opportunity um, for people to learn um, through experience. We do lots of activities, it's not just sitting for two days. There's a lot of, of different activities that we do that I think build on that. Thank you. André, uh, quel conseil donneriez-vous à une personne qui effectue actuellement la transition et qui éprouve de la difficulté? Vous savez, euh, c'est très difficile en tant que porteur d'uniforme euh, de sortir euh, à la réalité de la vie civile quand on a été formé à, à se tenir les uns les autres, à, 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 à s'entraider. Euh, le retour à, à la vie civile est un, un contexte complètement différent. Euh, L'isolement, c'est ce qui peut nous détruire le plus, de penser qu'on garde ça pour nous autres, puis de, le fait de ne pas en parler aussi, c'est une autre euh, chose difficile à, à vivre, mais euh, ce n'est pas évident non plus en tant que porteur d'uniforme. Ça, je peux de, éviter l'isolement surtout. Leo, did you want to answer something around that too? What, what would you give in terms of advice to anybody who's currently in the release process and is having a, a difficult time with it? Again, I think we've, we've emphasized it a bit earlier, asking for help, but honestly, the course was another great tool in my toolbox, uh, especially at the time when I was releasing. It gave me some uh, great information, um, not only for the veteran. I think I have uh, was taught and tried to, every time you receive an award in the military or a promotion, you shared it with your family. It's not just your award, it's a family award. Well, when you apply that to your mental health condition, it's not just your condition, it's all part of the family and getting more family members on the course, such as spouses, like Linda was on it. And if one spouse can hear from another spouse that walking on eggshells is a very common term, but you don't want to share that with anyone because it's not something you're real proud of, because like, that's not a really great environment to be in. But uh, if you can hear that from another spouse on this particular course, that they're going through some of the challenges and how they dealt with it, it just makes it so powerful, not just for the member, not just for the caregiver, but for the whole family. And just to when the member is releasing, it's not really just the member that's releasing. As Leo said, it's the family. I mean, because nine times out of ten, it's been their career as well. I mean, when the members are deployed or sent on courses, it's the families that are left behind to deal with everyday life. So when they're being released, they need to depend on their families, and the families need to depend on them. And it's hard to do sometime when there's a mental illness involved in it or an OSI. And this course helps you realize that you aren't alone and there is help out there for all of you and it doesn't hurt to ask for help and is there additional advice that you give somebody uh, who's a, a family member who, who's living with someone who is experiencing PTSD the biggest thing is that don't be afraid to ask for help and it's not you're not alone that's the biggest thing is you are not alone and 
It's okay to sit down and have a cry. It's okay to, to go outside and scream out at the top of your lungs. It's okay because you're not alone and there are people there to help you. And you'd want to acknowledge that there would be good days and bad days? Definitely. <laughs> roller coaster ride. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it is a roller coaster ride. I mean, my husband's doing fantastic, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be another dip. If, if I can add to Linda's comments um, about what would you tell a caregiver um, or a spouse, um, I would say don't give up on us. Um, thank you for my wife for not giving up on me. Because um, there were certain times where I was in the low spots that, uh, I'll be blunt, I was an A. <laughs> you know, I wasn't one of those guys that you wanted to be around with. I wasn't very friendly. Um, and uh, she stuck by me, and she's gone through it all. And we have our challenges, but uh, she didn't give up. And so as a spouse out there, um, don't give up on them. We really appreciate you, and we love you, and this is who we want to grow old with. But, uh, yeah, we're sorry for putting you through the challenge. But together with the resources available to us and together as a family, we're going to pull through. André, est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à ajouter sur ce sujet? Oui, euh, en tant que porteur d'uniforme, euh, vous savez, euh, demander de l'aide, ce n'est pas notre, euh, pas notre, euh, notre bonne euh, euh, pas une qualité pour nous autres. Euh, parce que dans le militaire et de un, on est souvent en groupe, puis euh, on a été formé à les plus forts, vont chercher les plus faibles en arrière, on se revient de bord, les plus faibles sont là, on s'accompagne, donc on devient plus fort. Mais un coup rendu à la maison, là, on a beau regarder 360 degrés, euh, L'aide n'est pas là, puis on, on sent qu'elle n'est pas là. Mais euh, euh, on a quand même, il faut se servir de ce qu'on a autour de nous autres, ce qu'on nous a appris. Si on n'a pas la famille, on, on a un ami. Puis souvent, en parlant à un ami, ben j'ai quelques cas que ça a été le cas. Un ami m'appelle, dit j'ai un ami qui a, qui a besoin d'aide. Be... Puis nous autres, le mot aide, on a de la misère avec ça. On, euh, fait que oui, euh, parler à un ami, c'est ce qui nous reste, il faut se servir de ça, c'est un outil de travail. Gara, you wanted to answer, uh, add something? I, I did. Um, it, the truth is, the, the research does show that a, a veteran who has a good social network and has a good um, support system at home are the ones that will fare be better. So I want to encourage people to reach out to such a program and other programs. But also, I wanted to caution with Linda, too, because oftentimes the, the family members or the caregivers are reaching out, and sometimes w the advice that you get is how to care for your loved one. But what's important is how to care for yourself too. It's just as important because if you're not doing well, how are you going to be able to, to offer help to yeah. your loved one, right? So it's your self-care is equally as important. It took me a long time to learn that. <laughs> Absolutely. A long time to learn that. It's yeah. kind of like the analogy when you're on the airplane, put your mask on first uh, yeah. before you put it on the kid. kids. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 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 Exactly. We uh, talk about that a lot in the course um, as we go through um, algae, uh, which is that brand. Similar to um, physical first aid, it's the process that's used um, as we move through helping someone in a mental health crisis. And when we get to kind of the end where we talk about encouraging other supports is we always talk about the importance of um, the impact of mental health on the family and really ensuring that you check in with that family um, and make sure that they're doing okay because it is exhausting um, sometimes supporting someone with a mental health challenge. So I really encourage people to do that. Talk to the families, make sure that they're doing okay even if it's just a quick phone call and to check in with the, someone. And no. a lot of times the families are forgotten. It's, you know, um, you're taking care of the sick, the sick one and the families are totally forgotten. And you're right, the ones that have the family or friends that stick beside them are the ones that do a lot better. Um, Kelly, what have been people's reactions or feedback that you've received and seen from people that have taken the course? How has it helped or changed them? I think um, because we really work on the message of hope, recovery, and, and reduction of stigma, um, people leave, like I said, at the end of the two days, um, feeling that there is some hope, that, that there is should be a focus on recovery. So almost a shift in kind of um, their thinking patterns around mental health um, and saying, you know what, there is, there is chance of recovery for people, and that's what we need to be focused on. Not focusing on the illness, but focusing on what do we need to do to get healthier and better use the word hope and uh, being in the military for many years we live on acronyms that's our language right it's the acronym world and uh, I, I use a lot of acronyms for me to help remember things and when I see the word hope I have healthy options personal experiences 
and hope is, is if you can get those tools and skills that you do encounter or personal experience that could be challenging from a mental health perspective, you have options on how to deal with it successfully. And so hope is so huge and that course really gives you a lot of hope and uh, you know, us sharing this information, I hope that gives other people out there hope as well. Is there anyone else who wants to speak to reactions that they've seen? It's ridiculous to think that things will change if we don't do anything to change them. That's the basis of all success, with hope. It's reality. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I think that the mental Leo, do you think it's still hard for military members to talk about mental illness? Absolutely. Are we, are we, are we, breaking, <laughs> are we breaking down the stigma at all? <laughs> wow. Uh, I think uh, Andre can probably relate to it. Um, you know, you join the military, you're taught about teamwork, um, you're taught about leadership, you're taught about getting the job done regardless of sacrifice. You just go out and do what you need to do to get the job done, and you do it in a very professional manner. Um, so when you're suffering from a mental health condition, uh, one of your first reactions is denial. Uh, even though you're progressing in an area that's not very comfortable, whether it be substance abuse or alcohol abuse or anger or whatever the situation may be. Um, and then when you do um, get formally diagnosed, I guess we will, with a mental health condition, it's a big secret. You don't want to share that with anyone. You're feeling weak. You're feeling defeated. You're feeling like you let the team down. You're, there's so many negative feelings that go with it. And it's, a lot of it is related to the public stigma as well as our self-imposed stigma. But I, I'd have to admit that we are improving greatly with the programs out there and the various organizations on helping remove the public stigma. More and more people are becoming aware of mental health conditions and, and how to um, live with a person with a mental health condition in a very successful and happy way. So uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, uh, I can't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> you caught, oh, the stigma is a difficult, yes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, I, I still think it is. Um, I believe it's going to minimize over the years as we keep moving forward with these programs. But uh, I would have to say, if you talk to anybody who's just been recently diagnosed with a mental health condition in the military, you are very quickly become pulled back and don't want to share. André, sans doute, vous avez quelque chose à ajouter. Surtout, euh, surtout imaginez-vous en service, juste quand on se fait mal, on n'est pas mentalement affecté, mais on se blesse. On appelle toujours ça le marché, monter les, 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 monter les marches de la honte. Euh, on n'a pas encore touché au cerveau, là, on a juste fait mal physiquement. Puis euh, ça, là, c'est... Euh, puis en, en même temps, euh, vous savez, la sécurité publique du Québec ou euh, à travers le Canada qui a, qui a trait à la sécurité publique, euh, eux autres, si le civil a besoin d'aide, appelle la police, appelle les ambulanciers, appelle euh, toute la sécurité publique. Nous autres, la sécurité publique, quand il y a, exemple, la police a besoin d'aide pour le verglas ou pour des euh, majeurs, on appelle qui? On appelle l'armée. Mais nous autres, qui on appelle quand on a besoin d'aide? On est en haut complètement, là, on... puis on porte l'uniforme. Qui on appelle? On apporte ça même dans la vie civile. Là. Si j'en parle, ça va te changer. Bien, c'est ça notre, problème, notre réalité à nous autres. Qui est... Juste de parler, c est, c est la... ça fait tellement la différence. Merci. Linda, I have a question for you. In your experience, and, and what's your opinion on what the first steps family members should take uh, to help themselves and the military member who may be suffering from a mental health injury? Admitting, I guess, would be the first thing. Um, I hid very well. I was very good at putting a smile on my face and going home and, and going into the shower and picking up a face cloth and crying into it, thinking I was hiding it from my kids, to which I found out now that they're adults, I didn't do a very good job at it. But admitting is the... the and it's okay to admit it. It's okay to admit that your loved one is sick. You're trying to protect them. You're trying to protect their world as well as their, and it's okay to admit it and learning to listen and then not being afraid to ask for help. That, that's a huge step to take is to take that step forward and go out and ask. And there's so many organizations, the MFRCs, OSIS, they're all such great organizations to go and ask for help. And taking the course is amazing. It, it gives you so many tools to put into your toolbox to help you when you need it. Kelly, do you want to add something I to that? I think um, recognizing too that in the course we, we talk about mental illness and what those symptoms look like. And for some people, and I, I've had two participants come back and tell me that in their workplaces, they were actually able to recognize that a colleague was suffering where before they, they just thought it was, 
you know, laziness or, or something, and then came back to me and said, you know what, I actually think there's something going on with this person, and I've been able to chat with them and get them to help. And I think that's a big tool for families, is just understanding that what they're seeing is actually a mental illness developing. And the earlier we get someone support with a mental illness, the better um, success rate we're going to have in getting them healthy again. She brings up, a, they both bring up really some really good points. Um, I found one of the challenges was um, sharing the fact that you have a mental health condition even with loved ones. You know, your spouse might know, but if your children are moved away somewhere, you didn't want the children to find out, or you didn't want your parents to find out, or your siblings, or, or your wife's parents. You just, no, this is our little secret. Can we keep it there? And um, that's not fair, quite honestly, to everybody involved, because um, by reaching out and, and sharing the information, compassion is there waiting for you. Um, help is waiting for you. All you have to do is just step out and ask for help. You don't even have to, it's not even so much to ask them to help, but it's a form of asking for help and just saying, hey, this is what's going on with me. And uh, they get it. They get it right away. Like I said, the, the information that's available right now to all the uh, people who are suffering from mental health, the caregivers and the people in the community, there's a lot of information out there that really will help you come forward and ask for help. You don't have, it doesn't have to be your little secret anymore. You can share it. I'm proof. <laughs> Thank you. Mireille, selon vous, quelle est la mesure la plus importante qui favorise votre santé mentale et la santé mentale des autres? Euh, C'est vraiment euh, prendre soin de soi et puis s'assurer que le petit moment dans, dans la vie, qu'on les apprécie vraiment. Euh, et puis, c'est être à l'écoute des autres euh, et puis vraiment les écouter sans jugement. Alors, ça, ça revient un petit peu au concept du cours euh, d'écouter sans jugement. Alors, prendre soin de soi puis écouter sans jugement. Merci. André, des conseils? Oui, une bonne réussite là, pour la santé mentale, c'est euh, autant comme père aidant que pour personne qui est en détresse psychologique. Fais ce que tu aimes, fais-le souvent. Ça, c'est une recette là, qui m'aide à passer au travers euh, parce que c'est quand même pas évident aussi non plus aller écouter des gens et puis de donner les ressources, puis de, de, les outils. Donc, j'ai appris, euh, ma recette à moi, c'est fais ce que tu aimes, fais-le souvent. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that with regards to mental health, uh, sometimes people see it as all or nothing. And it's really a process. It's not that you're going to go to the mental health first aid uh, training and, you know, learn some new things and put things in your toolbox and walk away, or help someone who's, who's, uh, who's experiencing a mental health crisis and that when they pass a travail that so that they're cured. Uh, it, there's no such thing. It's like, I loved when you said, Leo, that you're living with PTSD, not that you suffer yes. from PTSD because you are living with it. And the reason I bring it up is because sometimes down the road, and I think uh, Linda, you alluded to it earlier, you might hit a bump in the road and, and that's okay. Because sometimes people will say, you see, it's always going to be this way. I'm never going to get any better. And that's not true. That's just part of the process. And hopefully when you hit that bump, you have a sufficient amount of tools in your toolbox that you're able to get beyond that and carry on. Um, remission for life is a fantastic thought, dream to have, but it may or may not be possible. So I, I say it because I, I, when I worked with veterans, I, I would tell them this, not to discourage them, but so they anticipate it. And when it happens, they're prepared and they know that they can get beyond and, and, and work towards exactly. better days. I've often said that I was on a roller coaster mm -hmm. living with my husband since his diagnosis. The dips were, the, the highs and the lows were unbelievable. But now it's a gentle ride. It's like a kiddie's ride and it's just very, very gentle. And for every down, there's an up. And I know now that there's an up for every down and that's, mm -hmm. That's a great thing for me is to have that, to know that there's going to be an up and to know that the dips aren't near as bad. And if I can just add to that, um, through the mental health first aid training, when we teach um, participants the algae process, um, that's not a one-time thing with a loved one. You might come back to that process time and time again to help them through, and that's okay. Mm -hmm question from uh, one of our Facebook viewers. There's a lot of discussion about family. What about those with no family? All through my military career, there seemed to be less for single people. I, I, yeah, I'm really glad, because I was sitting here kind of thinking that too, is, is um, not everyone has family. And, and it's, it's really working um, to reaching out to people 
in your community to get support and whether that be a professional whether that be another veteran um, it's that to me is very very important is and sometimes it's very hard to do to reach your hand out to other people um, but putting that hand out so that someone can reach back and kind of pull you into their circle I also think um, and Andre alluded to it earlier um, when you wear the uniform you're part of a family your brothers in arms we will call them and um, if more and more of our military members take this particular course I think we as an individual is having difficulty that may not have a family um, can reach out to their buddy because you're gonna have buddies for life because of the military and you'll share with them just about anything and anything um, so if you're comfortable enough that you know your buddy's got the training or he's not gonna judge you um, you're gonna reach out to your buddies for those guys that are single um, and, and don't have families you've got a friend you've got a social network but you also have your brothers in arms in the uniform and reach out to them reach out to your peer you know no one's saying you have to reach out to the, the commanding officer or anything like that or the chief warrant officer we're not telling you to do that that's not a bad thing to do either but if you've got a buddy that you've served with in the military who's a very close friend one of your best friends probably reach out on disait que le psychologue est passé ou le psychiatre, mais en parlant à un frère d'armes, on dit des choses qu'on n'a pas dit au psychologue ou au psychiatre. Puis pourtant, qui fait tellement de différence que le psychologue devrait le savoir parce qu'on se dit, on se fait dire que eux autres, ils comprennent, ils entendent, mais toi, tu comprends. Tu as marché sur le terrain, tu as porté l'uniforme, tu comprends. Oui, c'est vrai que la famille des militaires, même vétérans, après, euh, après la vie militaire, on a toujours un, un frère d'armes, une sœur d'armes à quelque part qui est ami Facebook ou dans la, dans la ville où on est. Là. Euh, oui, ça fait une différence dans, te, euh, dans la communication. So I think we probably have time for about one last question. We've been talking a lot about advice that you would give now. What advice would you have liked to be able, that you give now, that you would have liked to have been able to have received five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what advice would you have liked to have had in those situations? Linda? I think it would be not to be afraid to ask for help. Not to wait till I was going down the dark hole that I was going with my husband at the time and taking my kids with me was to learn to ask for help. It was okay. And I think had I known that 10 years ago, it would have been a lot better. Um, I'm a military spouse too and I think it it I think I wish I had had this knowledge back then and I could have done a better job of, of picking up on some of those early signs of mental health and those I care for <laughs> Could someone else will come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. My, my head's spinning. Ce que j'aurais aimé longtemps c'est qu'il y a juste ceux qui font rien qui font pas d'erreur. On a porté l'uniforme euh, notre passé, ça, ça, ça doit être un lieu de référence. Le seul endroit où ce qu'on a le contrôle, c'est le présent. Le présent, là, présentement. De parler, d'être écouté. Si on est avec quelqu'un qui a reçu les, les bonnes formations, les bons outils, il y a toute une différence qui va se faire. Puis croyez-moi, ça fonctionne. I would normalize what somebody was experiencing because they think it's so extraordinary and again we go back to the isolation of being alone but it's a mental health condition I mean it's in the DSM there's treatments for it there's medications if non medications there's other treatments and you can get beyond that it, it, when they feel so isolated like what am I going through what's going on and they don't understand it I think knowledge is power and the more you know um, the more you feel you can get beyond that moment so um, that would be my advice if I had it back then I, I think for me the um, the best thing that would have been good for me 10 years ago as an example or 15 years ago um, was knowing that um, if you do have a mental health condition it's not all negative you can go on to have a very successful life um, there's going to be some trials and tribulations with regards to whether you're going through counseling, uh, psychiatric counseling or medication or peer support groups. Um, if knowing 10, 15 years ago the success of them and, and how it's allowed me to be successful moving forward with this condition, uh, that would have been pretty powerful. But also, I also think too, you've got to be in the right frame of mind to accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 years ago, I don't know if I would have been in the right frame of mind to accept it. I am now, and so it's, 
Uh, I just want people to realize right now that you can really have a very successful life. There's people out there that are willing to help you get there. Thank you, Leo. Mireille, any final thoughts? I think just generally knowing that you're not alone and the more mental health first aiders that there are out there, the more we can help um, veterans and people in our community struggling with the mental health problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank each of you for submitting your questions to the panel and participating in this discussion. And I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their stories. Hearing personal experiences is always compelling, and I thank our panelists for having the courage to speak today. We hope it's been helpful. Any questions on Veterans Affairs Canada services and benefits, including how to access mental health first aid for the veteran community that we're not able to get to, will be answered on our Facebook page over the next few weeks. Through sustained dialogue such as today's, we will continue to raise awareness and end the stigma around mental health illnesses. It is our hope to encourage more and more veterans, Canadian Armed Forces, and RCMP members to come forward and seek the support they need and so deserve. Again, thank you for very much, everyone. I want to remind you to use the hashtag Bell Let's Talk in all of your conversations today. En poursuivant le dialogue, nous continuerons à sensibiliser les gens à mettre fin aux préjugés associés aux maladies mentales. Nous souhaitons ainsi encourager un plus grand nombre des vétérans, des membres de forces armées canadiennes et des membres de la GRC à demander et à obtenir le soutien dont ils ont besoin et qu'ils méritent tant. Je tiens à vous remercier encore une fois tous et chacun. J'aimerais vous rappeler d'utiliser le mot clé « bell cause » dans toutes vos conversations aujourd'hui. Voilà qui m'est fait à la discussion d'aujourd'hui. Je vous souhaite un bon après-midi. This does conclude our conversation for today. Have a great afternoon and thank you.